Okay, good morning. So today we'll be learning all the rules you need to know for making your code uh, very measurable, testable, and perfect. <laughs> I'll teach you everything you need to know. You need to like memorize it, obviously, right? Because if you don't memorize it, how can you know if it's good or bad when you see some code? Some people think that code is about aesthetics, I, but I, I disagree strongly. It should just be correct according to certain measurements. <laughs> I'm actually kidding. Um, I was planning to start this, um, this workshop uh, asking you guys to please present with each other to the people uh, at, your, at your side. And I will actually do it just in case, but I see that you're already socializing. I was going to ask you to please present, uh, present yourself to the person at your right or left or whatever, tell their name, and ask them if they are new to programming, and how long have they been working with Ruby. So please go ahead, you have two minutes. OK, starting. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming. It's amazing that you're all here. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> we learned here how to transform this type of code. You can see that it has some weird coding standards. It has like dollar signs everywhere, arrows for, for object orientation. Well, I'm actually kidding. This is just PHP. But uh, you can put here, you can put here any, any code you have in your applications that you feel is just painful to work with, that you feel it's more complex than it should be. Uh, any code that it should just be clearer, easier to maintain. Like you have an application for to-do lists and you can't implement a new feature, there's something wrong. Uh, so my goal is that after this workshop, you learn the specific te uh, steps required to actually improve that code base while you're working on it, without losing productivity and without obviously rewriting the entire application. So check it out because we'll learn how to transform this code into this one. Oops, sorry, into this one. <laughs> so, well, you can see that I'm cheating here, but uh, before and after, like I'm cheating here, it's just a one-liner hiding all the complexity somewhere. Uh, but the before and after code, after you implement some of the patterns we'll see today, can be as impressive as this, I can assure you. So that's amazing. And that's why I'm very passionate about refactoring. I think every one of us should be constantly, at least be aware of the, that these things exist, and then use them or not, freely. Like, really, there's no si silver bullet, I agree with David on that. <laughs> But at least we should be aware of what things are we not doing right and we could, just to, to not, um, not get, get, stopped, uh, get uh, stalled in our, in our development uh, when we get code li like this and we can't change it without breaking the application. So before we start, I, I need to know um, a little bit about you. Uh, how many uh, couldn't get the repository yet, my repository with the exercises? One, two, three, four. OK, who has a USB stick? OK, please uh, pass it around, and I'll be asking that question every two minutes or three. Anyway, as Jeff said, if you ha are having trouble and if you don't have Ruby or the repository, just please pair with the <laughs> Thankfully, it's not a hard drive. Just um, obviously, like, just pair with the person at your side and continue working. Um, OK. Uh, we'll see today refactoring patterns. I didn't want to put those enterprise words in the name of my talk, but that's what we'll see today. Uh, anybody say, um, familiar with these concepts, refactoring and patterns? Anybody want to describe like uh, the idea of what, what does it mean? That's okay if it's uh, very general. I want, uh, yeah, please. I see refactoring as editing your draft. <laughs> I know that sounds corny after what we just saw, but it is like you write something down and you say, how can I make this simpler? How am I making my point clearer? Perfect, yeah, indeed. And by pattern, by applying a pattern to refactoring, what we make sure is that there are specific steps to, to apply that will lead us to better code. And there are scopes also, so we won't uh, end up rewriting entire chunks of code in a, single, in a single hour. So what we learned today is uh, algorithms for improving our drafts. Thank you. Now a little bit about myself. Uh, I'll tell you what I've been doing in the previous years and why am I so passionate about refactoring in general and why do I think that people should think about this constantly. But first thing first, my name is not Tute actually, my first name is Eugenio. But I had a problem with that name because uh, there's a very famous Italian with that very same name. And so when people in the open source community wanted to Google me, they would see the ship, but I'm not a ship. I can assure you I'm myself. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Costa cruise ship. It was actually named after my name, Eugenio Costa. And it's, and it's crazy because uh, my grandparents actually traveled in that ship and they saw like all the merchandise with my name and they freaked out. And they brought home like big teddy bears, small teddy bears, bath mats. So my house is all now embroidered with my name. It's crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> this was not useful for open source because I want to relate with the community. I want to be able to learn and teach from the community. So I just chose my nickname, Tute, which is hard to pronounce, I think. 
<laughs> I'm coming from Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is um, in between Uruguay at the east, uh, Chile at the west. In the north, we have Bolivia, Paraguay, Brazil. Anyone here from Latin America or Spanish-speaking countries? Wow, so many. <laughs> okay, bienvenido. <laughs> Beautiful, let's talk after. And even though I'm from Argentina, I don't play soccer, but I do have an asado every four or five days a week. Um, coming from Argentina, sometimes I say very clearly what I want to say in English, but people somehow don't understand. So I was once at work and I said, hey, there's a bug in the software. And they were like, what? And I'm like, dude, there's a bug in the software. You mean a bug? Oh, well, if you're going to get technical, yeah, I mean a bug. <laughs> so please, uh, if you find something weird and you want to interrupt me, please do. And I'll just repeat it in different, different terms. So uh, in 2011, I worked in a small startup called Chef Surfing. I didn't follow any best practice. I was the dream of David, actually. I was learning by my own experience. I was doing whatever felt right. But I, wasn't, uh, I didn't know so much about architecture, patterns, and stuff. So I committed many mistakes there. And the team was small. I was my own lead. <laughs> so we wrote a lot of code. And every two months, the complexity would bite us. And so somebody would say, there's a bug in production. So please fix it. And I'm like, well, if I fix that, I have to, I don't know, break something else or just stop for days and refactor. And it was annoying. It was like weird. We have to stop for a week after two months, test and refactor. It was not predictable, not sustainable. It was just stressful. It felt very much like this. You are very carefully working with something, and some, some <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly it just breaks down. And it's like, I don't want to. There has to be a better world. Uh, so next year, I went to General Assembly. They had a Rails application in quite about Jape. But it was tested, so refactoring wasn't so risky. And thankfully, they told me, please refactor all the things. And so I did. <laughs> and the amazing thing in this story is that I, I actually could do it while, I was, uh, while my team was still feature shipping. They were still deploying to production, probably many times a day, while I was refactoring not only the code, but the database as well and stuff. So I, I felt that was a happy story that I want to repeat everywhere I can and actually improve it as well. Um, that's why I'm very passionate about it. Like in General Assembly, it improved so much the code. It made it simpler. It made it smaller. It made it easier to work with. It it made it like nearer. Uh, I'm sorry. I asked for the USB stick. Who has it? Who has my USB stick? Okay. Who needs it? You are using it. Yeah. Okay. After you uh, over there, they will be needing it. So. Um, and the team was so happy to receive these refactoring, these refactorings into the code base. Uh, because suddenly, we could stop the, talk the same um, language as, as developers, as the project managers, as the business owners. Uh, because when they said like, something like a classroom full of students, the code spoke about the same concepts. So it gained productivity week after week. And it's still, I believe, uh, reaping benefits. So. Oh, before, who, who here is like in a similar situation as I was in Chef Surfing? Here, where you, can, where you sometimes have to stop the world and refactor. Anybody like feeling they should improve their code big time? OK, not so many, happily. Wow, what an audience. <laughs> Hopefully, you will learn anyway. Um, before precondition, you have tests. Never refactor without tests. You, uh, you run the risk of um, introducing errors that weren't there, and everybody loses, you lose. Your client loses, the users of the application lose. If you try to refactor without tests, uh, you end up like, like this, like I was in Chef Surfing, like, oh no. <laughs> I thought I fixed something and I actually broke it. I would have stayed at home doing nothing and it was more productive. <laughs> so these are the four patterns we'll see today. These are the magical spells that you need to memorize so the code will be correct. <laughs> uh, anyone familiar with these ones? I'd like you guys to describe uh, whatever you, you know about them. For example, for intention revealing method, anyone would like to describe it? Nobody familiar with it? OK, please. You can look at the code, and it essentially tells you what it's going to do. It reveals its intention. Yeah, indeed. Um, indeed. It turns comments unnecessary, because suddenly the code itself is, is saying what it's doing at the same time. Uh, the second one we'll see today is special case object. Who would like to introduce the idea? Nobody? Special case object, it's a variant of null object, uh, null object pattern that I also, it's a case I'll present. OK. So special case object, uh, avoid type checks, avoid conditionals in your code. So if in your view, 
you have code similar to if there's a current user here, then display this welcome message. And if there's not, display this other one. All of those conditionals will, will like suddenly not be needed in your views, in your models, in your controllers, everywhere. So that's the idea of this one refactoring pattern. Replace method with method object, uh, which seems very, <laughs> very weird to speak about. Anyone familiar with it that would like to describe it? Huh, OK, so I guess I'll do it myself. But I'll wait another minute, though. USB stick. Replace method with method object is useful for uh, uh, extracting big methods from big classes without uh, needing to rewrite the whole thing. So the risk there is that there's many instance variables and there's too much context. And if you start to refactor, to refactor that right away, you will see that you break too many tests to be like uh, contained in a single hour of work. And suddenly you run the risk of, of uh, rewriting. So the interesting thing of this pattern is that it uh, scopes, scopes your work of refactoring that big chunk of code. And service object uh, is useful for extracting uh, responsibilities from big God objects. So typically, the user in a Rails application knows how to speak about subscriptions, about the product it buys, and so on. And it's like a 500 line of code if you're lucky. So with service object uh, refactoring pattern, um, uh, you are able to extract these uh, different concerns in an organized way. So I'll start now showing code at last. So intentional reading method is, um, is a variant of extract a variable or extract method in which you give a proper name to a, to a chunk of code so that it describes itself and you won't need any longer this uh, comment. So this line of code was totally cryptic. That, that's my own code, actually. And when I came to it a year after, I had to add the comment to myself because I didn't understand what was going on there. Uh, applying intentional ring method, which is a semi, is really, really easy. There's a really easy way in four steps that I'll show you right, right away. I could change it to this. This uh, there's the before and after code, which the code itself says says what's going on. Putting comments in code is a bad practice <laughs> because at first, like if you can code without comments, it it means that you're already writing code in a clear way, in a readable way, such that you don't need to comment in in natural language. And more than that, a comment is a lie waiting to happen because you may, in the future, change the behavior or something, and the tests run, and everything goes well, and you commit it. But you may forget to change the comments, and so they are actually misleading. So um, I find very interesting this idea of trying to code without comments. That's, that's another rule that you can bend whenever it's better to bend. But it's a nice rule for myself. Like, does this code need a comment? And so how can I improve it so that I don't need it any longer? The algorithm I have to apply in this pattern is you have a chunk of code. It doesn't describe itself. Add a comment if it needs it. If it has a comment, great. Then transform that comment syntactically. Remove the pound sign at the beginning. Change the space by underscores. And suddenly, you get a method. Run the tests. If you run the test at that level, the method will not exist. And so you go ahead and write that method. Remove the comments. And the code write, reads itself. I'll show to you this idea here, coding in the browser. Let's see, where am I here? So what I just said is, remove this comment. Look what I do. This is just syntactical, syntactical transformations. Remove the pound sign. Transform this into a method. Yeah, change it by the line of code we want to extract. And suddenly, no need of comment. Here, I can re define that new method. Well, whatever. It's hard not to look at your keyword. <laughs> And suddenly, the code uh, reads better. <coughs> so that's all we need to do. Just uh, remove the comments and uh, transform them in, into code. So we start now with the exercise. We get uh, 15 minutes uh, per each exercise. Let's start. Uh, do you have the, um, do you have the, um, the repo, all of you? So there is a readme there explaining how it works. I'll tell you right now before we start. Uh, there's four folders. For the four exercises, we'll see. They have the number at the left, like right, number one intentional link method is the one that we'll work to with right now. There's an app.rb file, which is the one with which we'll work. And there's tests then. To run the tests, you just run the app, the app, uh, the app file. So while you are coding, you can constantly be running the test and see if you are breaking something or not. And the goal is that the code that's there, instead of being a, a long method, which is quite wide as well, reads itself. So the implementation details go down in the class. You don't care about the implementation details. And the main method reads like English. 
So I'll be going around a few for 15 minutes and uh, work, uh, work together. Uh, please uh, start and ask me any question uh, if you have one. And please help each other as well. The first step, uh, guys, is please to run the app.rb file so that you actually see the tests run and they are green. Uh, you will need mini test. If it doesn't work for you, please pair with the person next to you. And I encourage you to work uh, in pairs. It will be better because it's a very subjective matter and it's more just collaborative and more fun anyway. So instead of having each one its own computer, I encourage you to actually work on a single one. Run the app.rb and uh, I'll be going around to, to explain what's the next step. After that happens, just make the code read itself better. Removing the comments, I'll open them up here. Removing the comments and making them code. A comment I forgot to make, uh, this requires mini test, and I apologize, I didn't include a gem file. I thought it was with Ruby, that's my mistake. So if you have many versions of Ruby, choose the one that has mini test installed, so you can actually run the tests. Uh, pair with the guy at, at your side, or the woman at your side, so you can actually work if it doesn't work. Um, and well, that's it. Like if you get a const miss, missing mini test, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's my mistake. Don't worry, I, I'm sorry. And uh, use another version of Ruby, or pair up with someone else. Time is up for this exercise. Thank you, guys. Sorry that we don't have enough time, so I'll interrupt you right now. This will happen in every exercise, and I'm very passionate about this. So if you want to like, talk with me in the hallways or later or through Twitter or, Git or GitHub, please do, because I love doing this work. But now I have to present more content, and so here we go. Uh, some people discovered, while thinking about this particular case or while refactoring, that there's some funkiness with the conditional and if the user is there or not, and which lines of, of code get executed according to the conditions. That, that's right, there's something funky in that code. And it's amazing that you found it. That's, that's another like, nice benefit of refactoring. You think twice about the same code, and you ask, is this a bug or a feature? And in this case, it was actually a bug. So not only did you improve the architecture of the code, and you maybe simplified it with one less uh, conditional, but also, yeah, you discovered something that was going on in your application and you weren't aware before of it. So that's another benefit, and thank you for pointing it out. That's, that's totally, totally correct. So I'll move on to, oh, sorry, I won't move on yet. There's one rule, speaking about rules, very tough, it seems, from this woman who is amazing at uh, speaking about uh, design and the software development. She's called Sandy Metz, and she said, your methods shouldn't be... She, actually, she's here, right? She's here right now, Sandy Metz. I would love to see her. I've never seen her. And I want to thank her for her great book. Uh, she said, your method shouldn't be longer than five lines. And that's crazy, because if you have a switch statement or an if with an else if, you're already in seven lines. So it's like, are you, are you trolling here? What's going on? But if you apply this pattern a certain amount of times, it's actually easy to get to that size. Because you start like, uh, moving implementation details, like the switch statement, like the if router at last, into, into private helpers in the same class. And suddenly, your code at the top is just speaking English. It's uh, just saying, if user is uh, old in a, like, I don't know, older than a week ago, and you can write that in Ruby in English, uh, suddenly, it's easy to follow this rule, which is amazing. It leads to better code in general. Uh, and sometimes, you should bend it, for sure. But you should have someone that authorizes you, so she says. Um, this is arguably the easiest pattern, because it's just, uh, sorry? Oh, thank you, wow. So let's hide it. This is arguably the easiest pattern because it's just syntax transformations. Wow, sorry, sometimes I... Do I need a microphone at all? Can you hear me like this? Yeah. Oh, a little, okay, so I stick with the phone, microphone. But it's also the hardest one because it implies naming. And naming is hard, it's true that it's hard. And not only naming, it also implies that you know which are the levels of abstractions of your code, which, is, which counts as a business rule and which counts as just a, an implementation deal. And well, you will see what feels better. If you make a change on your code and the before and after looks worse, ditch what you did. At least you gained a perspective over your code and your problem. And if it's better, go on with it. 
So while it does seem simple, don't do it and just commit it because it may actually lead to something less readable or more confusing. Hiding what's actually a business, uh, at something that's core rule to your application and that should be there on the top. In the slides, I put resources always at the last of each uh, pattern. So uh, I'll share them in Twitter and uh, speaker deck so you will have them all. Um, moving on to special case objects. Uh, this avoids uh, conditionals in your code base. So suddenly you don't need to put an if. The thing that it avoids, especially the one that I'm going to show, is the nil problem. So you have uh, seen, as Ruby programmers probably, this hard to trace uh, error and define method email over nil class. You never know where did it come from. Because it could be coming from a hash with a key that doesn't exist, or with a hash that has that key but actually had nil as a value inside. Can come from a conditional that didn't run, like didn't have one of the bodies, and it returns that one uh, as an empty method. So nil can come from many places. It's hard to trace. So returning a symbol rather than nil is already an improvement because at least you can, you can get, instead of undefined method email over nil, you will get undefined method email over a symbol, over guest user. Abdi Grimm uh, suggested this uh, pattern, and it already helps to debug because then you, you find in project that symbol and you know where is it coming from. And even better than that, sorry, before that, uh, <laughs> uh, here we have this conditional that has to be there all the time. Whether you have a symbol, whether you have nil, you will need conditionals everywhere. There's not an object that you were expecting. In this case, the current user. So you can say, welcome, user.email. Uh, and if you f forget about it, you will get exceptions in production everywhere. And you will forget, because the applications get big. You have uh, to put these conditionals in views, in background jobs, in models, everywhere. So better than a symbol, the idea is to introduce a new object that responds to the same methods than the object we are uh, replacing. So in this case, in the top, we have a new model called null user, which is not active record. It's not baked uh, in the database or anything. It just have, uh, have some methods. Then we have somewhere in the controller the current user helper, which either finds the one which is logged in, and if it can't find it, it will return a new instance of the new user. Suddenly, the view has no conditional, because whether there's a user back in active record who is real, who has a real email, or there is this new null user, it will display the correct welcome message. And suddenly, not only that conditional was fixed, but all the other ones in the, your whole code base. And suddenly, you don't need to remember to put these conditionals everywhere you use a user. And so it avoids uh, future problems. And suddenly, the code reads better also, because you have like, less imperative uh, instructions in your code base. So that's the idea of a special case object. Um, let's move on to the second exercise. I'll put there. Again, my Vim uh, window. Uh, I've seen many having trouble with mini test gem. Please, uh, if you don't have somebody working like beside of you, because two of you have that problem, move, uh, move around and find somebody who can do it. Please pair, because of all of this is so eager of, is so subjective and so interesting to discuss about. It's much more rich uh, to be discussing one problem together rather than being in parallel, trying to solve it by, by yourself. This is not hard technically, but it's hard like, uh, like uh, which decisions to take, which code to write, how to name that method, why to extract it. So please pair. Please be noisy. Uh, let's see. So folder two. I'll show it to you here. I'll explain to you this problem. Uh, this is extracted from an application I worked with, actually. Um, there's a user who has a subscription. The last one is the active one. And you can cancel that subscription. You can show it in the, in the report job, which is a background cron job that sends emails to the business owners. And uh, it may be nil, because sometimes that subscription may not be there because the user signed up but actually didn't subscribe. So the goal is to introduce a new object that we return here. Uh, so uh, that when subscriptions that last is nil, we, we return something else. And start simplifying all the code. After that's running, after you get a new class with a new object and you return it there, you can get rid of the conditional line 4 and all the conditionals that are below line 25. So that's the goal today. I'll leave here some syntax. And you please uh, move on. And I'll be going around and ask me questions and stop me. Go on.
So sometimes the mini test problem is uh, because of Ruby versions. 2.1 and 2 and 1.9.3 run different. My tests uh, are inheriting from mini test, I don't know what, and he knows how to fix it. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a syntax change that if you make starts working. So please ask him if you think that's your case or change Ruby versions. Timeout is over. How did this one go, guys? Was it better than the previous exercise? Two was better than one? Yeah, so I think I'm happy to hear that. But if you have any trouble, please poke me. And where are, yeah, he will be helping as well. Thank you. And uh, yeah, you please stand up. We three are helping you guys. So whenever you're stuck with any step, any syntax uh, problem, or any interesting discussion to have, call us three. Where are your names, guys? My name is Jeff. Jeff? Roland and Tute, obviously. Well, obviously, sorry. Um, okay, I'm happy that this one's better. Now we'll move on to replace method with method object, which is for when you have code like this, which is so ugly. This is uh, the first uh, intention ruling method that was like um, removing duplicate from the code. I took it from this piece of code that I wrote myself when I was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it's super long and ugly, and there's like two chunks of. of uh, of uh, of behavior, there's some initial. It's like a class in itself. It's like a class in itself. This method, um, and more problematically, this method was inside of a class, which was itself big. So whenever I tried to change the behavior, I would have to change the instance variables and so the other methods that were using those instance variables and everything. And it was a big rewrite that I couldn't afford because I I didn't have tests. But thankfully, previous year I saw the talk uh, through the internet from Katrina Owens in Cascadia Ruby, where she implements this, this pattern in a code which was as bad as this one. Uh, and it's a great talk that I encourage you to see. She speaks for one hour on how did she solve it and how did she develop tests for, for chunks of code that were completely untested. Very interesting. Um, so I'll show you again an algorithm that you just apply and suddenly, boom, it works. It's better. Uh, the first step is to look carefully at it and get scared. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. The first step is to create a new class. Every, every time we have a problem in object-oriented software, typically an answer is to extract a new class, a new object uh, encoding this behavior or data. Uh, in this case, I know that this code, because I studied it and a year after writing it, was trying to format a CSV with one shape, a file with data, into another shape. shape. Let's call it format A to B. And the first step is to create a class with the same arguments in the initializer as the method itself. There's going to be four steps. You don't need to memorize or take note of them, because they are written as a comment in the exercise, in the file, in the code. But I'll now go through them. The second step is to copy and paste the method's body into this new class uh, with no arguments, because now we'll be using uh, the instance variable that we set in the initializer. The third step is to replace the original method in the big class with a call to this new class. So suddenly, the, the method which was problematic in a class that was big and complex is a one-liner. Suddenly, that class got smaller. And the big chunk of behavior got its own object with its own name. The fourth step, apply intentional revealing path pattern, intentional revealing method to the new class. And this is safer now, because you are now constrained into this new object. And whatever you do there in this new object is isolated from the big class and hopefully the application itself. So now you can do this uh, in a more uh, constrained environment, in a more safe one. And whenever you want, you can commit. And if the tests are green, then it's going to be fine. Um, if you do it before, you run the risk of having to change too much code at once. And that's always dangerous. So the whole idea of this is to apply intentional link method in a way that, that you don't touch too much of the application. So I'll open up that code now. Uh, it's the three, number three. Uh, here is the big method. So the very here are the four steps that we need to do. I'll do the first one. You define, sorry, let me remove the comments. You define a new class there. Let's call it format A to B, but you can call it whatever it makes sense to you. And you define the initializer, and so you go. That's my suggestion as first steps. Uh, 
and then apply one or two iterations of intentional revealing method and continue running tests all the time. And call me whenever you need help. Well, time is up. Uh, I'll go on to the fourth uh, pattern, service objects. But this one, I won't exercise it because it will move uh, uh, after the hour we have, which is until 12.30. So I'll just uh, explain it to you. And you al always have the exercises in your machines, and you can poke me, and we look at it together later if you want to, and if you don't want to, <laughs> whatever. Uh, here are the resources. One of the links I put here is actually the video from Cascadia Ruby from, uh, from uh, I forgot the name, <laughs> Katrina Owens, thank you, uh, which is a great, great explanation of how this should be factored something like this. Um, so the fourth one is service objects. Um, the problem that it solves is uh, when you have a God object and uh, you want to add new behavior, in the case of my application I was working with, we have a user which was big. It wasn't so big, it was a greenfield. But anyway, we need to add uh, subscriptions. And subscriptions wouldn't belong to the user, although it was so easy to implement it there. Uh, the problem was that if we put it in the user, we would be coupling a new dependency, losing cohesion for the user, testing gets harder and slower, suddenly a user can have so many relations and so on. And following the single responsibility principle, which we all love, especially, especially David, uh, you can't describe any longer your class with and, uh, without and. So now the user is this thing that knows how to persist itself, knows about uh, how to send a welcome email, knows about authentication, and also knows about subscriptions. Uh, that's not a problem if you have a rather small object, but if it's a, if it's a class that's already about 300 <laughs> lines, it can, start, it can get painful. Um, the name service comes from Domain Driven Design, which is a great book about how to architect your software in a manner that makes sense also for non-technical people. Um, it's a service as opposed to a, a value or an entity. Uh, this is a little bit technical, but the idea is that the service has a only behavior and no state. It, it's not persisted in the database. So in the case for a subscription, uh, it was a, a service because it was just uh, connecting to a payment gateway, checking if there was any error, either validating the credit card or a connection error, and all that logic had no, no state. Uh, I'll show you some code uh, quickly. We won't exercise this one. Let's see. And I'll, I'll move on. Uh, oh, uh, and before, I will also uh, tell you that I have a branch in this repository called tute-solutions. tute-solutions. So if you check out that branch, you will have four new files in each one of the, f I mean one new file in each folder, which is app-solutions, tute-solutions, or something, .rb. And you can see my take on these refactoring patterns. They are arguable, uh, we can discuss about it, but they are for sure better than the code before refactoring. Uh, I'll do it now to explain this before and after for a service object. Uh, so I'll open the before here. So we have this user, a typical Rails class with validations, callbacks, authentication, notifications, and suddenly we added subscribe, which, which had this funky method, try API to handle errors, uh, and subscribe, which is uh, the opposite. And this crazy logic, which was only concerned about subscriptions, but was living inside of the user object. So when we extra extracted it out, I came into this code where the user, let me go down, where the user only calls that service, it initializes it here as a private helper, uh, it sends the, the user, it sends self to it, and it calls on it, subscriber and subscribe. And the user doesn't care what does that mean. If it's through an API, if it's through a phone call or through fax or whatever, the user just doesn't care. All that logic lives on this new object, subscription service, which receives a user and performs all these, lo these, these things, which in this case is connecting to the API. That's the idea of a service object. As I said, we won't exercise this now, but I'm very happy to discuss it with you guys if you're interested later through Twitter, whatever. Uh, going back now to the talk. Uh, again, the branch for my solutions in the repository, tute-solutions, plural solutions. Uh, if you want to check the map, compare, uh, and so on. Let's see. Uh, next steps, if you want to continue learning about um, 
about the refactoring patterns, the code design, like in general, just send pull requests to GitHub. It's a gold mine. I, I learned a ton there. The community is amazing. There's these two projects that are, uh, are actually needing quite a bit of refactoring if you are interested in specific ones. But you can choose whichever you want and just contribute. The smaller ones are easier to get, to get, to get in because the community is smaller and they need just more time and you will get more feedback. People, in my experience anyway, in smaller projects, I, I received more constant feedback. And that was very useful for learning. Go to GitHub if you'd like to continue working. If you don't want to break your own applications, send pull requests and see, and see the code improve. As another next step, uh, I encourage you to follow, <laughs> follow the rules all the time. Follow the rules. I'm kidding. But the four rules from Sandy Meta are amazing. They lead to they lead to green pastures, and they are easy to grasp. Uh, classes should now be longer than 100 lines of code. Methods should not be longer than five lines of code. If you can think about these problems and try to shape your code in that manner, you will be following a lot of patterns, a lot of de design like ideas. You will be following best practices without needing to study them all and become an erudite of like all these things without becoming a computer scientist. I love these rules because they are so easy to, to grasp and they improve so much code bases. And if you then want to actually study why they, they lead to good code or not and so on, it's your choice. Uh, but I strongly encourage you to, to know about these ones and try, try to, to apply them to your own code. Then the, the other two ones are a method should not accept more than four parameters and a controller should just instantiate only one object which I never wrapped my head around it yet. So if you want to teach me, actually, please do. Uh, why refactoring, in my opinion, it's not only about aesthetics, although it's a consequence, but it's about the shared understanding of, of how your project works in your team and with your business owners. In my opinion, refactoring uh, is, uh, s brings so much productivity because suddenly discussing the things we need to implement with the business owners, with the project managers, and fixing the problems that arise become easier. If you have a smaller code base, as David said something amazing. The best, the best key to improve codes, uh, code is delete key. I strongly believe that. If you don't need to solve a problem, don't solve it. If you can delete code, delete it. And you will have uh, more understanding and less errors in production. And it may also be about performance. Today, Adrian suggested to me that if you are, in, um, if you are using null objects, um, you should also make them singleton because they are always returning values, and so you don't have 1,000 objects saying all the time the same. Uh, it's also about ref a performance. And of course, about also uh, finding undiscovered yet bugs. Um, another idea that I like to think about while refactoring is that we work with the tools with which we work. We are kind of meta professionals <laughs> because we like so much saying meta as developers. We are the users and the creators of our, of our own tools. This would be like we are carpenters and we can shape the precise hammer that we want, the precise tool that we want rather easily. Like you take the hammer of another person and suddenly shape it to your own hand, to your own strength. And that's crazy power for us. Suddenly we can shape the computer however fits better to us. Uh, that's an idea that I, that I always find interesting. And the last one. If I'm going to chase a bias between over and under engineering, I will always choose over. Because under engineering is risky, expensive, and overcrowded. So that's all. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed, and see you around. <laughs>